Hey, in today's video, I'm talking about the seven root causes of inflammation and autoimmunity. And with all of these causes, none of them really outrank another one. All of them are key contributing factors in driving inflammation, driving autoimmune responses, and all of them need to be considered and addressed if you're trying to heal inflammation or trying to heal autoimmunity. And so let's take a look. First one here that I've got listed, again, no particular order, but leaky gut and low stomach acid. So we know that the gut is actually like a tube that separates the outside of our body from our bloodstream. And so normally there should be very tiny microscopic holes in the gut that allow for uh, fully digested food particles to get into the bloodstream where they can then obviously be, be transported to cells and be used for energy. When those little microscopic holes called the villi in the small intestine, when they start to break and now we start getting larger holes and when our digestive system gets compromised from things like not being able to produce enough stomach acid, um, not being able to produce enough bile from our, our liver and gallbladder, not being able to produce enough digestive enzymes and having bad bacteria building up in our digestive system, now we start getting large undigested food particles getting into the bloodstream and that drives up inflammation. We also get bacteria and bacterial waste products in the bloodstream. And that signals to the body, wow, these proteins should not be here. We're at a risk for an infection getting into one of our, our vital organs and killing us quickly. So let's drive up inflammation to protect the cells, tissues, and organs of our body. And so if that happens for a very short-term period of time, you might notice it, you might have some discomfort, you might have a little bit of inflammation flare up, but then it gets under control. But if this is happening with every single meal, we're just driving and driving and driving the inflammatory pathways in our body and we create a, a state of chronic inflammation that can also, depending on your, your particular genetics, turn into autoimmunity or an autoimmune disease. So leaky gut, low stomach acid, really key. Stomach acid is key for really initiating the digestive process, sterilizing the food, killing off bacteria that's coming in with the food that we're consuming, breaking down proteins, absorbing key nutrients like vitamin B12, iron, magnesium, calcium. It's really key for all of that. It also helps stimulate bile flow. It helps stimulate pancreatic enzyme function. So it's really at the top of our, our digestive system and it kind of sets the tone for the rest of the gut. We're not producing enough stomach acid because we're under stress or maybe we have taken a lot of NSAID medications or heartburn medications that deplete or reduce our ability to produce stomach acid. Perhaps we're really, we're, we've gotten older and we've had a bad diet and we've had a lot of stress throughout the course of our life. Aging, uh, aging unsuccessfully over, over time can cause poor stomach acid production or maybe we have an infection like an H. pylori infection that's stopping our ability to produce stomach acid. Whatever the major cause is, that is going to set us up for chronic inflammatory and autoimmune conditions. So this is a key area that we have to address if we're going to heal and put an end to the chronic inflammation and autoimmunity. Number two is blood sugar imbalances. When our blood sugar gets too high, it creates hyperglycemia and the, the sugar molecule, the glucose, will actually combine with proteins and create sticky proteins. We call these advanced glycation end products, AGEs. These AGEs are very destructive in our body. They trigger uh, oxidative stress and inflammation throughout our body in particular in the endothelial lining of the blood vessels, damaging the blood vessels. And so when people have hyperglycemia, it drives up inflammation throughout the entire body and reduces, because the blood vessels are becoming damaged, it reduces the amount of oxygen and nutrients that can get into cells causing them to become hypoxic, nutrient deficient, and then they trigger a cell, cell danger response and that triggers inflammation throughout the body. So we've gotta keep the blood sugar stable. We also don't want too low blood sugar because that creates a hypoxic state as well. Now the cells are, go into uh, you know, basically a cell survival mode which triggers inflammation. So really good blood sugar stability, very important for triggering healing of inflammation and autoimmunity. Number three is trauma. And that trauma could be physical, it could be car accident. It could be, you know, you, you slipped and fell and that triggered, you know, that caused tissue damage, 
which triggered inflammation. So we've all experienced some sort of physical trauma. It could also be mental or emotional trauma, whether we were under a lot of stress, maybe we're under a lot of stress with deadlines at work or school or whatever we're dealing with, or emotional trauma, maybe a family member passed away, maybe um, somebody we care about said something really nasty and mean to us, maybe we're going through a divorce. Um, these are all emotional traumas. Maybe we had ch early childhood trauma where we were abused early in life. All of those things trigger a stress response in the body and they trigger infl inflammation. So we've got to work to unravel those, uh, deal with those. Obviously, we're always gonna have some level of stress. So we really have to develop a positive psychology, right? A growth mindset that allows us to deal with the stressors we're dealing with. And if you've, you know, dealt with a lot of, let's say, adverse childhood events, getting therapy, right? Getting uh, somebody that can help work with you to unravel those and um, figure out how to change your mindset and allow you to overcome those, tr those traumatic uh, types of experiences you may have had. That's key for healing. Number four is high toxic, lo toxic load. So we are constantly being bombarded by pesticides, herbicides, by chemicals in our air, water, food, by chemicals, you know, when we're, we're in our home, we've got off-gassing coming from carpets, from, you know, if we got new furniture, that new furniture is off-gassing. Um, we are, you know, again, toxins are everywhere, right? So we're always being exposed. Maybe you've got mold in your home, and so you've got mold and mycotoxins. Really, you know, that's a really, really hazardous chemical exposure that, that you know, is, is affecting a lot of people. Maybe you've got amalgam fillings, heavy metals in your mouth that are leaching into your bloodstream and into your brain. And so all of these exposures um, build up, right? And so all of us are, are being exposed to toxins. We're not going to get rid of toxin exposure, but we need to minimize it. We need to lower the level of toxins that we're being exposed to. Once, that, once the, the level of toxins hits a certain threshold, right, it's gonna trigger a lot of inflammation in our body and an inflammatory cascade. So the best thing we can do is reduce our exposure to those toxins and then support our body's natural drainage pathways, making sure that we're peeing and pooping, right? Toxins out of our body, that's key. Sweating them out, things like infrared sauna exercise. Um, breathing them out, respiration is a key way that we move those toxins out as well. So reduce exposure and then help improve our body's natural drainage and detoxification pathways, super key here. Number five, and this is probably the most common, especially in our westernized societies, it's circadian rhythm dysfunction. All of us have experienced this. We've been up late at night. We've been up working or being exposed to blue light, bright lights at night. And then, you know, we don't sleep well. We wake up in the morning, right? And oftentimes we spend most of our day under artificial lights inside the house. And so we're getting really bad light exposure and you know, there, there's a saying that says, malillumination or poor light exposure is to the body what malnutrition is to the body. Light is information to the cells of our body, just like nutrition, just like getting nutrients is. And so when we're getting the wrong light exposure at the wrong time, that actually tells the cells we're in a dangerous environment. And they go into what we call a cell danger response, which ultimately is gonna trigger more inflammation and you know, if we're continually triggering that cell danger response and we're not going through and healing and, and resolving the healing cycle because we're continually adding this sort of circadian rhythm stress on our body, then we trigger more inflammation. So it's really key that early in the day we're getting a lot of good sun exposure, right, or natural light exposure. That's really important. It helps set your circadian rhythm. Your circadian rhythm says, okay, if I'm getting a lot of sun exposure now, that means, you know, roughly 12 hours later, it's gonna be time to really wind down and start secreting more melatonin for good sleep. So we set the circadian rhythm when we get early sun exposure. Getting some really good sun exposure in the middle of the day, UV light, okay, UV light exposure, actually really helps set the circadian rhythm as well and helps give us energy, mental clarity uh, for the rest of the day. And so getting good sunshine in the morning midday, even if it's five minutes, that's, that's fine, right? And so if you can do 10, 15, 20 minutes, great, right? But even if you just go outside for five minutes, that's gonna help your circadian rhythm. It's gonna help bring down inflammation in your system. And in the evening, right, trying to get some sort of, trying to get out into kind of the, the red light that you'll see with sunset. There's, a, there's an ancient 
proverb, right, that says, it's, it's just a wise saying, it says, if you want to have great energy during the day, watch the sun rise. And if you want to sleep well at night, watch the sun set. The types of uh, rays that are coming out, the, the photons that are coming out are, are red and infrared early in the day and late at night. And those are very anti-inflammatory, very good for the mitochondria, set the circadian rhythm, set you up for good sleep. Now, once the sun goes down, you need to make sure that you're blocking blue light. So blue light blocking glasses, dimming all the lights in your house. You can get orange colored bulbs, right, that don't emit blue light, but instead they're more of like a, a amber color. And that would, would you know, mimic fire that our ancestors would have been exposed to that has less of a melatonin suppressing effect. And so I wear blue light blocking glasses. We dim all the lights in our house around, I would say 8, 8.30, somewhere in that time frame. put our kids to bed. And if we're on electronics, we make sure that, you know, our electronics, we have iFlux on there, which is uh, naturally dims it. And a lot of these iPhones now will, will do that. A lot of these uh, different uh, mobile phones will do naturally kind of take out a lot of the blue light, but, but not enough. So you really need to have the blue light blocking glasses. So if you're using electronics, watching a TV or whatever it is, make sure you got the blue light blocking glasses. Make sure the volume's not too high, right? You don't want anything that's gonna overly stimulate you. The best thing to do is actually read, right? And so read before bed is actually a really great strategy to help enhance sleep. Um, and that helps, you know, basically calm your mind too, especially if you're reading something that's refreshing, uplifting, right? That's gonna really help calm your mind and help set you up for really good sleep. Try to get in bed you know, I would say 11 o'clock at the latest if possible, right? Obviously, I know some of you guys might be shift workers, things like that, but do your best to try to get, try to be in bed before midnight for sure, but you're actually going to secrete the most growth hormone, which signals healing in your body between 10 p.m. and 2 a.m. So you're going to get more growth hormone release and more of these anti-aging hormones that enhance the healing process in your body if you're sleeping between 10 p.m. and 2 a.m. Um, and so being in bed early, really key for that. I recommend not working after 9 p.m. and just really allowing your, your, your mind and your body to naturally wind down, getting out of blue light, things like that. Um, super key for setting circadian rhythm. So that's very important. Number six is chronic infections, right? So infections like viral infections in our cells or you know what's really common now is seeing a lot of oral infections, maybe gingivitis that hasn't been addressed, or root canals that your dentist thought were addressed but are actually harboring uh, bacteria, harboring dangerous bacteria that are releasing endotoxins directly into your bloodstream. Or maybe you had your wisdom teeth taken out or some other tooth, and there's actually a, what we call a cavitation that is an area in there that most dentists will think is sterile, and that there's nothing going on. But the latest research has shown that, and it can be found on a 3D x-ray, that these often harbor bacterial infections that are kind of stealth infections. Like they're, they're not as easy to spot. And these infections, these, the bacteria are constantly releasing endotoxins that are driving up inflammation in the body, wearing down the immune system. So this is common. So viral bacterial infections, we, you know, we talked about H. pylori infection in our stomach that could, that could uh, stop us from producing stomach acid effectively. Could be gut infections, parasites, um, candida, or fungal overgrowth in our system. There's a whole, no, whole wide range of different infections that individuals will deal with, but that has to be addressed as well. We're not going to get rid of all the pathogens. I mean, that's not, it's not realistic, but if we can get them under control, reduce their overall burden on the body, that's really the most important thing so our body can adapt and heal. So infections are very important. And then number seven here, nutrient deficiencies. And so maybe you're vitamin D deficient. Maybe you are zinc deficient. Maybe you're magnesium deficient. I only mention those three because I, I see those being the three most common nutrient deficiencies. But of course, we could be deficient in antioxidants in general, vitamin C, glutathione, uh, we can be deficient in amino acids, right? It's key amino acids that help produce glutathione. Amino acids in general that help support all the different tissues of our body, especially if we have low stomach acid, if we're not eating a nutrient-dense diet, we can have a whole number of different nutrient deficiencies. So we wanna make sure that we're addressing that as well, looking at what nutrients we may need more of and supporting those. And so that's really key And all of these things. You know, when, when somebody has chronic inflammation, autoimmunity, 
it's usually not just one of those areas, right? It's usually a, a accumulation of maybe three, four, five, maybe all seven of those areas that are coalescing and creating what we call a high allostatic load. That allostatic load is kind of the pathological pressure on our body, this pressure that's leading us down a route of cell danger response, being stuck in the cell danger response, being stuck in a chronic inflammatory amplifying cycle and triggering, you know, perhaps for certain individuals, autoimmunity. And that puts us in this pathological state. So we have this high allostatic load from the accumulation of these stressors on the body. And that load is too much for our body's own natural ability to heal, repair, and adapt, right? So our body normally has a certain load on it, but it can adapt to it. It can repair itself, heal, and actually get stronger and more resilient. For example, we think about exercise. Exercise is very stressful on the body. In fact, if you do intense exercise and I take your blood work, right after you do it, we're gonna see really high inflammatory levels, real high CRP, uh, different in inflammatory uh, biomarkers. But we all know that exercise done appropriately allows us to become stronger, more resilient, more fit, more metabolically flexible, some amazing benefits to it. So the really the key is how well is our body adapting to the stressors we're under and how well is it then healing and regenerating. And so what we've got to do is work to get the overall allostatic load down so our body can now heal and regenerate. So we want to address all these areas to bring down that overall all allostatic load so your body can heal, repair, and function at its best. Hey, if you enjoyed this video, be sure to check out my channel, browse the various videos that I've done on similar topics, and also make sure you subscribe to my channel and hit the bell button. That way you get notified whenever I put up a new video training. Thanks so much for being a part of our community here, and I really hope you enjoy the videos that we're putting out on a regular basis. Be blessed.